Well, it's a, it's a it's a pleasure to be here, and as uh, Bianca mentioned, I'm extremely new to uh, the American Farmland Trust, and um, very happy to be on board with such a such an important mission and working with some great people. And um, I'm uh, honoured that you've all decided to come to listen to what I have to say, and hopefully it's of uh, of use to you, um, and you can understand my deep southern accent. Um, so we'll. Uh, We'll get we'll get moving. So the object the object uh, objectives of what I want to discuss today is is sort of the role of permanent pasture and grazing management and soil health. Obviously, you've had a bit of that already from uh, Bianca. Um, discuss what the current management practices are in conventional agriculture. Sort of how how the current state of the of the business is. How we got here. Uh, how we got here is a very important aspect of that. I think if we understand of understand it, why we are where we are, then it kind of helps us come up with solutions and gets into the, the psyche of the farmer. And, and I am a farmer as well, so I kind of understand a little bit of that. Um, but understanding how we are, where we are, um, why we practice the certain things we do in, in current industry and then how that in, impacts soil health is, is a very important part of understanding. Uh, what are the barriers to the change, um, practical, geoclimatic, and socioeconomic. Again, Bianca sort of touched on some of these things. I'll delve a little further into the actual grazing management side of things when it comes to these, these factors. And, and how do we over overcome these barriers? Um, whether it's practical, whether it's geoclimatic or socioeconomic, um, they're all significant barriers. Some are harder to breach or breach than others, but uh, there are solutions out there and, and sort of a certain amount of what I do in both farming and now as a as a practitioner is to try to break down these barriers uh, and improve the adoption of these practices that not only help the farmer but help the environment. Uh, I'm also going to touch on sources of information for help um, other than ourselves um, and and I hopefully leave a, a good amount of time for some questions and feedback um, and try to uh, offer offer any other Bits of information that are that are out there. Grazing is a big, you know, is, is a big thing, and we could you, literally books and libraries have been written on it. So I'm going to try to dive as deep as I can without um, sort of turning you off or going into the technical side of things that may be a little bit too too in depth. But there, if there are aspects you want to explore further, then then hopefully we can get into that uh, in the question session. Um, so a history of grazing and livestock production in the United States. Um, I do appreciate the irony of a New Zealander educating what I assume is predominantly a bunch of Americans about, about their history, um, but it is quite interesting if you think about why we currently graze the way we do uh, in the United States, and it really goes back to the 1940s. Uh, a lot of people don't realise that prior to 1940, or prior to the 1940s, grazing was actually the predominant practice of livestock production. Uh, both dairy industry and the beef industry were, were predominantly on pasture. Rotational grazing was employed. Um, so, you know, it hasn't always been this way. And so how did we get here? Well, 1929, the first corn hybrid was introduced. And then after the Second World War, a lot of these factories that were making munitions and bombs uh, needed to be redeployed. And they were redeployed primarily into making nitrogen fertilizer. So at that point, we had these uh, new corn hybrids and an abundant source of relatively cheap nitrogen fertilizer. So if you look at corn acreage in the country, it hasn't really changed much over the last 80 years or 100 years, really, even. Uh, but if you look at corn yields uh, with those new hybrids, it's gone up exponentially almost from you know, less, than, less than 50 um, bushels to over almost 200 bushels, and I know, I know farmers that are growing 300 bushels. So the amount of corn grown in the country is is massive now. So what what that did was event ultimately create a significant surplus of corn. Uh, and now, if we fast forward 80 years, uh, that corn, a lot of that corn, has now been diverted into feeding livestock. So over 40% or almost 40% of the corn grown in the United States now is fed to livestock, whether it's poultry, pork, but including the ruminant animals, uh, beef and cattle, uh, sorry, beef cattle and, and dairy cattle. So um, it's the single, one of the single largest use, uses of, of corn in the country. 
um, equal almost to ethanol production. So if you look at actual human consumption of corn in this country, it's relatively small compared to those two things. So what that did is really create a drive towards a new type of agriculture where animals were outdoors grazing, both in the dairy and beef industry. Uh, the feeding of corn meant that in order to make it efficient, we had to move the animals to where the corn was grown and then house the animals or put them in free store barns to make the feeding of corn more efficient. If we congregate the animals together and bring the corn to them, it makes it a much more efficient system. Now, not only did that change the out outlook of agriculture and, and what was going on and how the animals were fed, it also changed the R&D practices and capabilities. Everything from genetic improvement to animal nutrition science to, you know, you name it, animal health remedies, all these things all were focused on animals that were housed and fed corn. So there was a divergent pathway, if you like, from what was done prior to 1940 and afterwards. And then we've now, so we've now had three or four generations of farmers that have kind of lost this knowledge. So we've got a genuine loss of knowledge and a, and a rebuilding of agriculture that's based around corn or the feeding of, of concentrated grains to animals. And not only has the knowledge been lost, but the animal genetics has been lost. Uh, I'm a dairy farmer, uh, and one of the biggest challenges I faced in developing a pasture-based dairy uh, was finding animals that were suitable to graze. It's a little bit less of a challenge in beef production because a certain amount, and, and certainly the cow-calf and prior to going to the feedlots of the beef industry is still on pasture, and that's why we still have a large pastoral-based industry because of those beef cattle. So now, again, we've kind of come full circle. We're, we're back in a situation where the, the, the assumptions of 80 years ago and even 30 years ago are somewhat different when it comes to the low cost of feed, energy, and fertilizer. Uh, and not only are we working on a false assumption of low, low input costs, we're looking on the false assumption that um, the conventional agriculture we're, we're employing today is actually good for the environment. So now we're looking at a we're looking at a situation where things like grazing are coming back and in, into focus as a, as an opportunity. But as I mentioned, a lot of this information and knowledge has been lost, and a lot of the R and D has been lost. So we're asking to introduce a bunch of practices where uh, a lot of this information it still exists, but there's a there's a there's a generational mind gap of of how to do it, uh, or or even can we do it? I mean, it's so it's so. It's been so long since people have been grazing in a, in a rotational grazing sense in this country that, that a lot of that's just been lost. And which is one of the reasons, farmers are hard headed anyway and, and set in their ways and I am a farmer, um, but it's not just about that. It's not just about you know, resistance to change. It's, it's a genuine lack of, of information and knowledge out there in the farming community. And that creates a lot of anxiety in, in, in adopting and changing a whole a whole system that's that's built aside from you know the knowledge. There's also this infrastructural changes, the, the building of free store barns and feedlots and tractors and things that the the conventional agricultural system here is very mechanised. So there's a there's a, a massive disincentive, if you like, from the generational um, farming of of livestock. In, in the conventional agriculture to, to changing and doing new things. Uh, but as we know, grazed, grazed ecosystems uh, are one of the greatest opportunities to sequester carbon and offset greenhouse gas emissions. So we try to need to try and get over this knowledge, uh, knowledge gap and behaviour gap and create a major shift in farmers and try to get them to, to at least adopt some of these practices to help. Uh, as I think Bianca calls it, sort of the new, the new conventional, and that's that's where uh, that's where our focus is. Um, a lot of you obviously would know this better than I. This the carbon cycle. Um, the reason I put this up there because I think it's important to understand the animal's role in the carbon cycle. Uh, the the animal was often cast as the villain uh, when it comes to environmental. Uh, practices, whether it's the fact that they pr produce methane, which is four times more, uh, four times more, um, I guess, deleterious when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and so the cow itself often attracts a lot of attention uh, 
as, as a villain when it comes to when it comes to environment and greenhouse gas emissions in particular. But actually, when you consider what what role the animal plays in the biogenic cycle, in the carbon cycle, you actually find out that the animals are a really important um, component of it. Uh, we all know grass or any any uh, plant material through photosynthesis captures carbon dioxide and turns it into um, usable carbohydrates for the animal and for humans, um, and also captures that carbon and puts it into its root system and then ultimately into the soil where up to 40% of it is locked up. So the soil is a tremendous uh, sink for carbon, but requires the plant obviously to put it there. So what role does the animal play? Well, the animal eats the grass and then defecates or transfers those, those carbon sources into manure, which incorporates into the, into the soil a lot quicker. So you can get carbon dragged or put into the soil through senescence and plant material and roots, which is a very efficient process, but the animal actually speeds that up by consuming the plant material and then through manure, um, redist redistributed onto the pasture, uh, it kind of speeds that process up, that carbon transfer from, from the plants into the soil. Uh, aside from that, it's hauled off as milk and meat. So there's a very important role the animal plays. And if you actually look at grazed ecosystems from zero to one to two cattle per acre, if you're right, the, the amount of carbon, soil carbon, uh, sequestration rate actually goes up. So soil carbon builds up much quicker in an ecosystem where there's a grazing animal consuming that plant and then putting it back into the soil. Of course, there's diminishing marginal returns. At some point, you get overstocked, and that's where you get into, in, into overgrazing and various other issues that we'll go into. Um, but having animals is actually better as a, as a way of transferring carbon out of plants uh, into the soil. So the critical element of the biogenic cycle, the carbon cycle, one of the critical elements, or the most important, I think, is really the plant itself. Uh, leaves are the solar panels that drive photosynthesis. Without leaf area, without something growing there, you can't capture that carbon out of the atmosphere and put it in the ground. So if you've got nothing growing, you're obviously not going to have a cycle and there's going to be nothing for the animal to eat to transfer into the ground. Green is good, so the greener something is, the more actively growing it is, uh, the better. Rubisco is the most abundant protein on the planet. It's, it's the, green, the green element in plant. Of course, chlorophyll is there, but Rubisco is the protein which is critical for photosynthesis. It's also the major source of protein for ruminant livestock. So without Rubisco, um, we're all in trouble. Uh, the greener the leaf, the more Rubisco, the more photosynthesis, and also the higher nutritional quality of the forage. So not having a lot of leaf area is not only good for photosynthesis and carbon sequestration, it's better for the animal. The quality of the, of the product or the plant rather is better. There's more carbohydrate, there's more protein as I mentioned, it's more digestible and therefore the animal derives um, greater benefit from it. So having leaf and having ground cover and having something growing there is, is, is better as we've discussed. So we've sort of set the scene as to agriculture the way it is right now um, and the fact that we don't have a lot of these grazing practices and the fact that we need something growing there um, to, to create that cycle and have the animal as its role in the cycle, harvesting that carbon from the, from the plant and putting it into the ground. So why do we have all these problems? And really my, the major thing is because of management and some geoclimatic conditions, um, we have negative impacts caused by things that are directly affect the forage plant or the forage growth. So taking taking that green plant, that leaf production out of the system somehow, whether it's through geoclimatic conditions or, or management, that creates the problem where we have we don't have enough of this grass and then we get into soil health problems. Some of these are geoclimatic, as I said, that we can't control. Uh, we've got seasonality of growth. Not different plants grow at different times. We have plant adaptation, different plants grow in different areas. I'm gonna talk about some of that, why we have um, certain gra grasses growing in certain parts of the country. Uh, we have lack of species diversity. Grass monocultures dominate uh, the, the United States, or dominate the world really. Um, and then we get into sort of the human aspects or the management aspects, which is poor grazing, harvest management, where you get into overgrazing, 
Undergrazing is not typically talked about much, but there is a problem with undergrazing or underutilization of grow, grown forage. If, if, if it's not getting grazed appropriately and not utilized properly, that cycle again breaks down because the animal's not consuming it or consuming enough of it and turning that and, and speeding up that sequestration of carbon through, through defecation. Uh, and then you've got poor, poor fertility and poor management. So why, does, why do we have monocultures? Um, part of the reason we have monocultures is we've got these, these geoclimatic differences as we go, predominantly as we go north to south in terms of heat, but also east and west as far as water. Uh, the east is very humid. Um, but if you look at the, the major driver of what grows where, it's, it's usually climate as far as temperature is concerned. Uh, we have a dominant, dominant cool season grasses. Cool sea gr season grasses are the C3 grasses. They're, um, they're, not, they're not non tropical, and then you get into the transition zone in the mid Atlantic. Uh, we have a combination of, of cool season grasses and warm season grasses, and then you get into the south or the deep south um, where you've got your warm season grasses. Warm season, a good example of warm season grass would be uh, Bermuda grass or Bahia grass. Cool season grasses like tall fescue, perennial ryegrass, orchard grass. There is some overlap, um, but typically these are the main regions uh, that will grow these different species. It's going to be interesting to see what impact climate change has on these zones of adaptation. What, uh, whether, whether we see, start seeing more warm season dominant pastures starting to creep north because of the warming of the planet. So, it, you know, Things are in constant flux and constant change, so it is going to be an interesting to see what areas of adaptation change and what different grass species predominate because of climate change. So if you break this down into actual grasses, uh, you've got the, the northern part of the east, east coast or eastern area from the Midwest out to the east coast, uh, is these cool season grasses like perennial ryegrass and orchard grass. Uh, you head further south, and you've got the tall fescue area, they call it the fescue belt. Uh, it's dominated by about 50 million acres of tall fescue. Uh, a lot of this tall fescue is, is endophyte infected and the endophyte is a fungus that, that lives inside the fescue. It makes it more resistant to edaphic stress, uh, climate stress, but also can be toxic to the animal, uh, which is why it does so well. And then of course you get into the further, into the deep south where you've got these warm season grasses like Bermuda grass. But almost all of these are grass monocultures. Um, and the reason the grass monocultures is because, because of the climate and because of the animal, the animal management practices with continuous grazing, grasses are the best adapted to stand up to high grazing pressure because of the meristem, because of where they grow from at the very base of the, of the plant. When the animal defoliates, it takes the leaf, but it won't take the growing point. So it's why we have grasses dominate where in regions where um, continuous grazing is, is the predominant practice. So grasses are great, they're the predominant forage species, but one of the big problems with, with grass is, is with, with any forage is seasonality and growth. Um, not every grass will grow well at the best times, and it's particularly a problem in some of these warm season grasses that are very productive in the summer that will go dormant in the winter. So you've got these massive growth growth peaks that occur when the temperatures, nighttime temperatures get above 65 degrees uh, and daytime temperatures up into the, you know, they love it. The hotter it gets, the, the more they like it, whether it's 90 degrees or 100 degrees. As long as they've got water and a, and a source of nutrients, they're going to grow and they're going to grow at a rate higher than just about any other grass. But for the rest of the year, after we get cooling days, um, certainly after frosts uh, or cold periods, you get zero growth at all and they actually go dormant. So this is, this is quite a hard thing to manage uh, where you've got massive amounts of grass that's exceeding animal demand and outgrowing, even if you've got four or five animals per acre, it's often hard to catch up with the tremendous growth rate coming from these, these, annual, sorry, no, these perennial grasses. There are C4 annuals as well that grow in, in a similar way. And then during the winter, there's nothing there because it's gone dormant. You still have the, the benefit of having a perennial crop and that there is biomass there and there is a root system there holding the soil together, but there's no growth. So there's no carbon sequestration. And this leads to a lot of problems with uh, overgrazing, impaction, 
uh, compaction rather, uh, disturbing of the soil, uh, soil surface because there's nothing there actively growing, um, even though there is a root system there. And a lot, of the, a lot of the south and a lot of the southeast is dominated by these, these warm season perennial grasses, whether it's commuter grass or Bahia grass. The cool season grasses, while do, we do get some growth out of them and it's a longer growth season because they, they are adapted to grow in, in cooler, cooler climates, they still have a, what's called biphasic growth curve. So this is a, an example of tall fescue, which uh, doesn't grow a lot during the winter, but you will get some growth depending where you are in the country. But then you have these peaks of growth. You have a massive amount of production in spring, then the summer they will, they will shut off as the temperatures get too hot, where Bermuda grass likes it to be 90 and 100 degrees. These cool season grasses, if they get above 85 degrees, really slow down or even shut off and can go dormant in the summer uh, if it gets too hot. And then again, they'll, they'll, they'll uh, pick back up in the fall when things start to cool and have another peak of growth. So longer growing season, but they're still seasonal. It, it still creates problems for, uh, for animal management, and in particular in a continuously grazed system, when you overlay animal demand. Um, animal demand is somewhat seasonal, particularly cow-calf, because they do calve and they do have changes in nutritional requirements throughout the year, depending whether they're lactating or they're dry. But even if you overlay the most optimistic seasonal uh, animal demand system, it's not going to match grass growth. So you're always going to have periods of oversupply or undersupply. And these periods of oversupply and undersupply are what create these opportunities for undergrazing and overgrazing. Uh, and in a continuously grazed system, there's just no way to manage that. You've got, you've got zero opportunity and zero mechanism to, to manage these peaks and troughs. So what is overgrazing? Um, overgrazing is really the continuous defoliation of, of plants by the livestock. Really, there is no rest. There is no opportunity for the plant to, to grow back from, from grazing pressure. Now, as I said, some of these, these C4 perennials and annuals can grow so fast that they, they still manage to outgrow the grazing pressure. Uh, but generally speaking, overgrazing and persistent overgrazing creates uh, such defoliation to such a level where you're starting to see a lot of a lot of ground cover, a lot of open ground, um, and, and it's and it's consistent and it persistent. And what it does, uh, it affects the plant's growth. So not only is the animal eating more, the grass is growing less. So it becomes a it becomes a vicious cycle and compounds itself. Uh, and when you get that grass cover removed, as, as Bianca has, has spoken about, you get soil, more soil moisture loss because you don't have the physical, physical barrier of the plant there keeping the moisture in the ground. The ground's more exposed to wind and water erosion. Uh, you get oxidation from sunlight. Uh, I, the, the, the sun itself and the sun rays hitting the soil do actually oxidize organic matter and, and have it released back into the atmosphere. Uh, and of course, what's what's happening above the ground is directly proportional to what's happening below the ground. So if, if we're growing less forage on top, we're growing less root mass below. One of the biggest problems or a big problem with overgrazing is that at some point something fills that ecological niche. Uh, and it's usually by things that the animal doesn't want to eat. So we're getting, we usually get a lot of weed infestation in overgrazed pastures. And often these weeds are either unpalatable or in some cases they're actually toxic. This is, this is buttercup, it is an annual. Um, and despite what people think, cows do not eat buttercup. Uh, it is toxic. It, it's actually, it has solenoid toxins in it. Uh, and it grows there because the animals don't eat it. And if they do eat it, they'll get sick. But this is quite common in, in overgrazed systems. And again, there's something growing there, so it is photosynthesizing and it is putting carbon back into the soil. But if the animal's not eating it, the, the efficiency to which that carbon is returned to the ground has broken down quite a lot because the animal's not partaking in the cycle. And as we've discussed, the animal's an important part of the cycle. So weed infestations and overgrazed pastures is, is a, a big problem. 
So I've mentioned overgrazing. There's also a problem with undergrazing. Uh, poor utilisation. It may not seem obvious, but when we get too much grass growth, it creates issues. High summer growth rates, you know, create a surplus that needs to be managed and dealt with somehow. This is usually managed with hay. So what a lot of farmers will do is, in continuous grace situations, is stock their farms with enough animals that they can carry them through the winter or graze them through the low forage growth periods. So they can manage the low forage growth periods by destocking. But what happens is then they don't have enough animals in the summer when the grasses are growing fast or the spring uh, in the case of the C3 grasses. So they usually end up with a huge surplus and this usually gets made into hay. So hay production is a big part of the current landscape of animal production because of these big surpluses. Now hay production in and of itself is not necessarily a problem except it's highly inefficient. Quality is lost. You're also burning a lot of diesel fuel to make hay uh, and you still have the surplus just because the animal can't graze it uh, making it into hay and, and storing it under a fence row doesn't mean the animal will eat it either because you, it's it's a genuine surplus the animal's still grazing the animal's still getting fed uh, but you're creating this massive surplus of hay that gets stored um, and doesn't really go anywhere um, so a lot of the hay in, in the country is not stored under cover so it's breaking down it's deteriorating, it's creating high nitrogen sites where, or high carbon sites where it's, it's out, of the, out of the biogenic cycle, it's not contributing to either the animal's performance or restoring the, the soil health. So it's a massive loss of not just carbon, but also feed sources and efficiency in the system. And then you have to feed it back, which is another, which is another labor intensive, diesel energy intensive process. So surpluses create as, not as many issues, but, but do create their own set of circumstances as well as overgrazing to the inefficiency of, of animal production. And then feeding hay like feeding grain is more efficient if you can congregate the animals and put them in a small area to feed that hay. So you, while you might be a grazing operation, you're actually then confining the animals again to feed them that hay. Uh, and that creates you know, high, high nutrient, high carbon sites uh, where the animals are congregating to eat that hay. So overgrazing in a continuously grazed situation and undergrazing is just is really part of the same problem, but, it, but they're both problems and perhaps not recognised as being such. In continuously grazed systems, you also, you also need to know that animals aren't... Um, they, they, they have their own set of behaviours. Uh, I, I use the example of, you know, they're very selective about where they will graze and even what they graze. Um, not just about what species of plant that they prefer over others, but even what part of a plant. Uh, animals will typically graze leaf before they'll graze stem because it's higher in nutrients and they know that. Um, but they'll also graze in certain areas in the pasture. And if they're not controlled and they're not managed in a way that um, rotates them or, or puts them on areas that you want them to be on, they will be very selective about where they graze. And the issue with that is they're taking nutrients and they're taking carbon uh, from those continuously grazed sites and they're redistributing those, those um, nutrients and carbon in a, in a non-uniform way in areas that they like to congregate. Most grazing animals, all grazing animals really are, are social animals. Uh, they're, they're driven by seeking shade in the summer when it's hot, so they'll stand around under trees. Uh, they will go to water sources and stand around, again, in the heat. Um, and in other feeding locations, we saw the slide of the hay, but wherever you feed other feedstuffs, animals will congregate and hang around and socialise. And sometimes they just like to hang out. That's what, that's what animals do. They are social animals, they're herding animals. And what they typically do is they'll graze in certain areas and then they'll go and congregate and where they congregate, they defecate and urinate uh, and lie down. And certainly where you're feeding other feedstuffs, you get these very, very high nutrient sites. Um, so in continuous grazing, the cycle again doesn't work because you're taking nutrients from one area and you're redepositing them in, in, in other areas. And this gets worse over time because the animals congregate in the same sites. They'll go to the same shade tree, they'll, they'll go socialize in the same area, I'll go drink from the same water troughs. Um, so again, continuously grazed ecosystems, uh, A, are not particularly efficient at, at recycling nutrients 
um, but also take what nutrients are derived from the grass and go and put them in other areas where, where you create this sort of mosaic of, of soil, soil nutrients and soil health, um, even in the same field. So we'll talk about some of the solutions. Um, one of the big ones is obviously trying to incorporate multi-species forage systems. Uh, again, you know, Bianca sort of mentioned in, in, her, in her presentation about the benefits of this. Uh, you get better productivity, you get a, you know, a longer growth season, because what you're trying to achieve here is, is, a, is a combination of different forage species that are, that are complementary to each other. You, don't, you want to try to avoid putting species together that, that do the same thing and grow at the same time, A, because they'll compete uh, for resources, but also you typically end up with one or the other. Uh, you get into a sort of a, a survival of the of the fittest or the well, most adapted species in that situation. So two two grasses that grow in very similar growth habit and grow in, in very similar growth seasons typically won't coexist very well because it's just too much competition. So when you're talking about mixed pasture species and mixed forage species, you really want to talk about complementary species. Grasses and legumes are very good complementary species, A, because they typically grow at different times of the year, but also because they occupy different uh, space in the canopy. Uh, grasses have a very different growth habit. Typically bunch grass, will grow, they'll grow in bunches with uh, little occupying the space at, at the ground level, but will kind of go up and, and fill out in, in a bunch, whereas clovers will occupy the spaces in between the bunches. So they typically work pretty well together. There are a lot of forbs like chicory, and I mean, there's literally hundreds of different forage species um, and you can go anywhere from a sort of a two two species mix all the way through to I've seen nine and ten and thirteen species mix. Again, they don't always work, and and it depends on the level of adaptation and and what sort of ecological niches the different species are, are occupying. Uh, but there's some good information about there about what species would work together. Typically, a grass, multi-grass, clover, or legume mix is 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 probably one of the best or best adapted. And why we don't have more multi-species mix is, as I mentioned, is overgrazing doesn't work with multi-species mix because you're applying so much pressure to the to the sward. You're favouring the grasses. Clovers uh, are not monocotyledonous; they don't grow from a growing point on the ground like uh, like grasses do. They grow from axillary buds and primary buds on their branches on their on their on the branches and stems. So when that when the animal defoliates them. The animal's defoliating not just the leaf, but also defoliating the growing point. So if you have overgrazing and very intense grazing pressure, you're not going to get legumes. You're not going, they're just going to die out and the grasses are just going to be left because they are the most well adapted to high grazing pressure. So multi-species mixes and, and overgrazing or continuous grazing just don't tend to work together too well at all. So the benefits of incorporating, incorporating legumes, um, specifically legumes are, are very good because they fix nitrogen. So not only are you creating a situation where you can extend that growing season and increase your total yield, um, you're also putting a plant in there that can supply nitrogen, not just for itself, uh, but also to the grass around it. So uh, legumes have rhizobia, Again, part of the part of the soil community, a bacteria that lives in the roots uh, of legume species, which is able to take atmospheric nitrogen and turn it into and turn it into plant plant usable nitrogen. Um, so the plant can use it to grow. Uh, but also though, th those um, those rhizobia slough off the roots into, into the soil uh, and provide nitrogen in the soil uh, for the for the grass to take up as well. Uh, also, the animal eating the clover or eating the, the legume um, is an important source of nitrogen. In fact, I think as much as 60 or 70% of the nitrogen derived from legumes in a graze situation is from the animal consuming the legume and then defecating the nitrogen back out on the grass. So if we think back to our continuous grazing situation and animals grazing in certain areas and def defecating in other areas, if you do have, if you are lucky enough to have legumes in your pasture in a continuous grazing situation, even the nitrogen fixation benefits will be lost because the animal's taking that clover and, and, and taking the nitrogen from the grazed area and going putting it under a tree or around a trough 
uh, where it's not particularly of much use. And then you get these massively high nitrogen sites uh, that grow, you know, that aren't in an area where the animal's going to graze. Because aside from them grazing in one area and defecating another, they also don't typically graze where they defecate or graze where they congregate. So not, so not only is the nitrogen going somewhere uh, away from the grazed area, the areas that it is going to are typically not grazed. So it's, it's a massively inefficient system. Uh, this is an example of where uh, C4 perennial grasses like Bermuda and um, alfalfa has been in interceded into it or direct drilled into it. There are grazing tolerant alfalfas now that um, persist very well in, in C4 grasses. And this, this particular example, it was work done by the University of Georgia. Not only does it extend the growing season because alfalfa is a, is, it's a warm, it's, it's tolerant of warm weather, but it is a C3, so it will grow in the winter and has a much longer growing season than, than Bermuda grass. So it extended the growing season. Not only did it extend it, it doubled the biomass. It, it went from a, a system producing about 13,000 pounds of dry matter per acre to 23,000 pounds of dry matter. So extension of the growing season, increase of total uh, biomass, and totally eliminate the nitrogen fertilizer needs. So that alone is a $100 to $200 an acre benefit, in addition to having twice the forage availability and a, and a longer growing season where you've got something growing all year round. So better for the health of the soil, better for the health of the animal. You can graze more animals, and you're not, produce, and you're not putting nitrogen fertilizer on the ground. So the benefits of legumes, um, is, is massive, both in terms of economics, biology, and soil health. Uh, but the only way we can achieve that is by grazing management and not overgrazing and not defoliating the pasture to the extent where the, the legume just can't, can't survive and can't stand. Um, I will say that legume, putting legumes in pastures does save from nitrogen fertilizer applications. It does not prevent the need for some fertility going in early on. Uh, legumes, aside from being less grazing tolerant, uh, are less tolerant of soil acidity. So if the soil pH is below 6.5, then you're going to find it very hard to grow legumes. Um, incidentally, you know, a, a, a sort of base, slightly basic or, or neutral pH is actually better for all soil, all soil biology, but it's particularly important for, for legumes. If you get soil pH that's you know, certainly below six, uh, you're going to really, really struggle to get legumes into pasture. So we need that lime, at least initially, uh, if you're planting legumes so to, to, to rectify any pH issues. Um, there's a lot of pH issues in the southeast, particularly because, um, A, because it, there's been a lot of nitrogen application and nitrogen acidifies the soil and, and drives the pH down. Um, legumes also need uh, good nitrogen fixes, but also need potash, uh, or potassium phosphate, sulfur, and all the other micronutrients. Boron is very important. So it doesn't completely eliminate the need for, for fertilization, but, um, but certainly that, that not adding all that nitrogen fertilizer uh, is, is better economically and certainly better for the environment if we can get legumes in there. Uh, another way of doing it outside of legumes to add, to add species diversity and ex extend your uh, growing season there are there are some annual uh, annual grasses and annual legumes um, that can be interseeded or overseeded into into warm season perennials like Bermuda. So uh, annual ryegrass, the small grains, wheat, rye. <coughs> there are uh, literally ten or twenty different annual clovers, whether it's crimson clover, arrowleaf clover, bassine, all like it go on in ad infinitum. So there are a lot of short-term legume and, and annual grass options that can be either no-till or broadcast into either dormant or semi-dormant um, C4 grass pastures to, to extend that growing season, provide ground cover and provide some actively growing uh, forage for the, for the cow um, for pretty much year-round grazing system. Um, it's, it's what we do at the dairies. We have very uh, large areas of, of C4 perennials that we over sow through no-till drilling every year with these with these cool season annuals, whether it's you know um, arrowleaf clover or crimson clover mixed with ryegrass. Uh, that, this is a picture of actually one of our cows um, in, a, in a 
perennial ryegrass, clover, overseeded Bermuda grass pasture. So it works very well. Um, and is actually more robust in some ways if it, if you do have poor management than a than a straight perennial clover system. So I've talked about some of the problems um, and um, talked about some of the issues uh, that, that have created you know the situation of overgrazing and and how that impacts uh, livestock production systems and the, and the carbon cycle. So what, what is grazing management? Most people, when they think about grazing management, um, think of it as an animal management tool. Uh, it's fences to keep animals out or keep animals in, which it is, but actually it's predominantly a crop management tool. Um, really what we're trying to do with grazing management and fencing is to control uh, the, the, the frequency and the length of harvest to optimize forage yield. So, um, it's it's a kind of that's one of the mental shifts or paradigm shifts that that farmers need to kind of understand. We're not really talking about animal management; we're talking about crop harvest management. So, if you use the example of a corn crop, uh, where you know if, if you treated a corn crop like a, like forage under continuous grazing, it would never produce any grain because you would keep harvesting the plant before it actually became right uh, to to harvest. So. Grazing management is really that. If you look at a, a forage plant, it has an optimum level of, an optimum period of grazing, and anything around that, overgrazing, optimizing the yield, and undergrazing, you're not optimizing the quality. So the ability to, um, I guess, harvest the animal at the optimum only comes about if you're able to, to use fencing and use rotational grazing and manage the animal so that it doesn't harvest the plant at the, at the uh, suboptimal time. Aside from the, the quality aspects of, of harvest management, if you harvest the plant at the wrong time, again, Bianca kind of touched on this, you either get overgrazing or overgrazing. And what that does is, is significantly impact below ground portions of the plant. Uh, you get too much uh, too much overgrazing. Not only do you get soil exposure, you get lower uh, root mass, um, longer recovery times um, and, and ultimately a, a poorer, poorer field uh, and poorer soil health. Uh, so optimi optimizing or grazing at a time that's best for the animal also happens to be best for the soil biology. And the only way you can do this is with rotational grazing. This is just a, 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 a diagram showing that uh, courtesy of Stan Boltz that, you know, the more you graze, the less root material you have the less soil biology you have and the less pasture growth you have. As you start lengthening the time to which the animals um, are resting the pasture, you start getting more of that growth, more of that root production and, and beneficial. So um, higher, in, higher intensity, lower frequency is, is better. And the only way you can do this is through rotational grazing. Um, this is just an example of percent of leaf moved versus um, root growth. So if you get up to 50%, so there's a, there's a saying, you know, graze half and leaf half as, as, a, as a grazing management tool. Um, you can still be okay, but generally speaking, if you get below that, you're gonna permanently stop uh, any kind of root growth. One of the biggest problems, I think, with adoption of, of grazing management is, is I think farmers are, are scared off by a lot of the terminology and a lot of the technology. Um, there's a lot of different uh, synonyms and acronyms out there for, for grazing management. Obviously, continuous grazing is relatively easy to understand. It's just having some animals out there all, all day long grazing. Uh, rotational grazing is really, for me, is a catch-all for everything. Um, there's new stuff out there, you know, adaptive multi-paddock grazing or AMP. We've got MIG or management intensive grazing and strip grazing. Really, what they are is just all versions of, of rotational grazing with, with increasing subdivision and control of the grazed areas. Uh, so as, as you go from continuous grazing, you're just getting more subdivision um, with, with more frequency of movement, giving the animals less area, but moving them more often. Uh, I've heard numbers of 30 to 50 areas being optimum, but it really, it's, it really doesn't matter. And there is diminishing marginal returns. You know, the more, more paddocks means more control, often it means more benefit, but there is, there is a diminishing marginal return to that. And at some point you start losing those benefits. Um, 
again, rotational grazing, uh, just dividing, dividing an area up into paddocks and rotating the animals down around them. So really it's just a way of controlling the intensity, frequency and length of grazing. Um, I do not like necessarily having the rotation like this uh, in that it implies you must go from one to two to three to four to five to six. In reality, grazing management is, is done in a more um, reactionary way. You have a plan, but really rotational grazing is just rotating around which, which field or which paddock needs to be grazed first. Um, and then, and then following a, a rotation based on basically what a fit, what we call a feed wedge. Uh, if, if you create a feed wedge, which is just managed managed fields or managed pasture over over the different areas, that will that will determine and drive where you put those animals and in what field you put those animals. Uh, so it is important for farmers, whether they do it with their eye or indirect assessment methods, to create a feed wedge. Uh, of fields and and try to manage their rotation. Um, and if you start getting, you know, if you start getting overgrazing, this feed wedge will all start to look the same versus having this, you know, long paddocks and short paddocks, which is really what you need to have. Uh, grazing can be very basic and, and really some of the major advantages or major benefits from grazing can be as simple as putting one one fence. I think the mantra that I'm going to employ or we're going to employ is, as, a, as people trying to take these technologies and adopt these technologies with, with producers as, and farmers is one fence at a time. Just start very simple and, and use one fence. The incremental improvements in forage yield and forage quality and soil health and all these things that we've, we've talked about it, it happens just from putting one fence and then, and then as that Proves out in their system, they can start to start to uh, you know make make further improvements. If you've got a good boundary fence, you can you can put a lot of fairly simple fencing and watering um, technologies in place with, relatively inexpensively. Um, rotational grazing can be used to manage periods of low growth. You can slow the round down. Uh, it sounds counterintuitive, but actually, when you've got less grass, you want to slow it down and keep the animals in one area for longer and feed them supplementary feed to allow area, more area to longer time to recover. So it's counterintuitive. Slower growth actually means slow the round down and give more area more time to recover. Um, the opposite is true for high periods of growth. You want to speed it up and try and eat as much of the grass as you can to not get into an underutilization situation. Or you can cut areas out and manage them individually or separately. Again, with fencing you can do this and maintain good healthy crop conservation practices where you're making high quality hay or forage that can be fed back later. Um, the economics and returns of grazing are, are pretty amazing really when you consider that you can get a lot of fence lining line done relatively cheaply. Uh, these are some basic costs. Uh, they're all over the map a little bit when it comes just depending on what type of fence everything from a woven wire that's two dollars per square foot to right down to sort of tread and post and poly wire which is you know less than less than a dime or, or a nickel a square uh, a linear foot um, stock watering again is all over the map but if you're putting in permanent troughs with you know two dollar a foot pvc and and three hundred dollars worth of troughs and fittings it's relatively inexpensive so a, a thousand feet of permanent cross fencing and water system might cost somewhere between less than a hundred Five hundred dollars and up to four thousand dollars, depending on what we're trying to um, trying to achieve. There's a lot of very good temporary portable fencing and livestock water technologies that are cost effective. Like again, you could put in one fence line for probably under five hundred dollars. Um, portable fencing again, you've got these poly wire rolls, um, solar powered electric fencing. That's a bat latch gate. And even just simple homemade watering devices, depending on how many animals you've got, are all very effective, cost cost effective ways of, of introducing rotational grazing. Um, these are just some different trough options. Obviously, you've got to have access to water. Livestock need water, so that's probably the biggest limitation, whether it's surface water or water troughs, in uh, in, in getting water an animal and adopting an, a, a rotational grazing system. Uh, the benefits of rotational grazing can be a little different, to, difficult to quantify, just because there's there's so many variables that that drive it. But just just as a basic um, example in a two field system, 
you're going to get modest gains in forage growth and yield of up to 10 to 20 percent you're going to get at least 30 percent to 50 percent in forage utilization which is more of the grass is growing is going to go down the animal's throat and that's going to directly result in an in improvement in, in animal productivity so depending on what you know how many animals you've got and and the market you're selling into at the very minimum uh, i've heard figures thrown around of 100 to 200 dollars a head uh, in additional animal performance and offset with not having to feed as much hay um, or, or other supplementary feeds and that's with just putting one fence in if you uh, if you know if you put multiple fences in and, and derive greater greater benefits that the, the the benefits also become somewhat exponential until you get diminishing marginal returns so the payback on grazing uh, improvements is is less than a year uh, in many cases um, just because the returns are so great and those are just the economic returns the returns to soil health uh, and, and environmental um, management of, of the pastures is is even you know even greater these are just some examples of uh, federal, uh, specifically the USDA and RCS programs that are around. Um, a lot of them are cost share or cost programs that can, so even if there's a somewhat of a sticker shock, even to spending, you know, 500 to $1,000 or $4,000 even on, on, a, on putting in some fence line, there are a lot of, um, you know, economic and financial help and cost share programs out there as well as information um, with the, you know, there's conservation steward program uh, Equip is a great one, Environmental Quality Incentives Program. They do a lot of cost share stuff on fences and fence lines and um, to helping farmers not just protect uh, sensitive environmental areas from overgrazing and grazing, but also helping people introduce rotational grazing. Uh, regional conservation partnerships and, and grazing lands conservation initiative. 